Hi everybody, um, sorry for the, for the delay. Um, and welcome to the first of two sessions that are focusing on the research we've been conducting in Afghanistan. In this first session, we're gonna provide some of the overall findings of our research. And then in the second, we'll zoom in on Nimrose province to provide a borderland biography that hopefully gives you more of a feel of the research we've been doing in one of our research sites. But a few quick words to introduce our Afghan research. Next slide, please. Now, our research um, has been divided into four kind of linked uh, and integrated research streams. The first strand of research has been focusing on the histories of drugs in these borderland environments. The second on the contemporary political economy of, of, of drug economies. A third stra strand of work has been looking at the health impacts of drug economies. And a fourth strand has been looking at drug policies and interventions and doing ethnographies and case studies of projects attempting to address drugs. Now that within the Afghan team, there's been a division of roles. OSDR, with the support of Jan Kohler, have been focusing and leading on strands one to three. And AREU, with the support of Adam Payne, have been leading and focusing on strand four, as well as the broader policy engagement and communication as well around the project. Now, at the outset, we plan to conduct work, research in three borderland provinces, Badakhshan, Nimroz, and Nangarhar. And they were chosen because they're very different kinds of marginal spaces with different experiences of, of, of wartime conflict, of um, illicit drug economies, of state presence, um, and also of different inter sets of interventions. Um, however, because of changes, um, very radical changes uh, um, in the context, and, and uh, we have had to make uh, adjustments to our fieldwork. So firstly, we experienced some delays because of the changing makeup of the Afghan team. Secondly, after planning a second phase of field work, COVID hit Afghanistan very badly, as many, as many of you will know, and we had to put field work on hold for quite some time. And then thirdly, having embarked on the second phase of our research after the COVID situation stabilised, we were then faced with a growing political crisis that led ultimately to the collapse of the previous government and the Taliban coming to power. Ultimately, this meant that reluctantly we had to drop the research in Badakhshan, at least in relation to strands one to three, and instead focus our efforts on research in Nimroz and Nangarhar. I think it's important to stress here, before moving on, that we're very conscious of the human and the humanitarian consequences of what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment how it's affecting people on the ground and who we are able to talk to in our research and how it's having very real consequences on the lives of our researchers and their families, including for some having to leave the country. I think the fact that AREU and uh, who, Ozala Ashraf Nimat, who is the director of our AREU, will be talking in a minute, and OSDR and Russell Hahn, who's the director of OSDR, who's going to be talking again in a minute, the fact that they have continued with their organisations working in such difficult situations um, is, is incredibly impressive and testament to their commitment to the work of the, 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 the project. And I think it goes without saying that we've experienced major ethical and security issues in conducting this research. Um, and uh, we have always been led in this respect by our partners on the ground and their judgments of what is possible and what is ethical. Next slide, please. So for that, I'm going to hand over now and we are going to do uh, the presentation as follows. Jan and Khulun Rasul will be presenting some of uh, a selection of some of the findings from the research in Nangarhar and Nimrose. Um, we will then hand over to Adam Payne, who will be talking about the work that he's been supporting around with AREU on drug policies 
and interventions or strand four of the research. And then finally, Orzala Ashraf Mimat will conclude with some of the policy implications um, and broader conclusions around this research. So I'm going to hand over now. And then after, after that, we'll have um, time for questions and answers. But please, if you have questions as we go along, type them into the, into the box um, and we will do our best to, to respond to them. So um, I'm handing over now to Jan and um, Ursul Khan. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, so we will present some, we, we still call it emerging findings, which, which is a little bit embarrassing because it's already the end of the project, but of course um, we are continuing to working on that. And it will be focused on the last two years in which the problems that Jonathan just elaborated hit us quite, quite hard. So a uh, next slide, just one note to the technical team. There are a few slides with uh, animations. So um, I might have to tell you uh, a couple of times to click. Um, so we start very briefly with just the ma major themes, questions and research methods uh, that came to application under the, uh, uh, under the description, uh, uh, described circumstances. Please click on. So for strand one, which has this more historic perspective uh, on transformations um, and the emerging the emergence of borderland drug economies, our specific focus here is on changing role of licit and illicit cross-border trade um, for lives and livelihoods with specific focus on the effects of changing of changes in the um, uh, uh, in the border regime along the border. And secondly, um, the question of what kind of uh, kinds of illicit livelihoods have emerged at the margins and how do they vary across context and time now except for the standard methods if you will if you look if you take a, a more um, uh, 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 historic view uh, on how you on how you get to get, get somewhere we uh, a, a key method that we applied that was proved to be quite useful our life history interviews with people involved in the drug economy so that is one of the core um, sources of information and also mapping of relevant cha relevant changes um, in the uh, in the geographies uh, along the border uh, was another important one Rasul Khan, I hand over to you to briefly describe the field work that you did in this context with your team uh, you need to unmute yourself please Yes, thank you, Jan. Please, next slide. Yes, uh, for uh, first uh, uh, strand, we conducted or we implemented uh, uh, different tools. Like in the first, uh, we use uh, left theory tools for that, and we interviewed a number of people, including traders, smugglers, brokers and local influential people in some administrators as well for life story. And the other type of tool that was used for that, uh, that was the uh, drug economy uh, focus interview uh, with the category of long-term involvement farmer, experienced farmer, farmers uh, and traders in uh, six uh, targeted district, uh, di districts uh, in Ningarhar in Imros province. And the third uh, tools uh, which was used for the first plan that was the village history. In the village history, we cover that uh, only in Nimroza uh, province and uh, that was uh, the, the focus was on the drug economy, smuggling and arm group uh, presence in the uh, village in the area. Please. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now, strand two then focuses on where we ended up and basically trajectories and outcomes um, mapping the contemporary political economy of drugs. Now, what is contemporary is, of course, always a little bit difficult in Afghanistan because things are changing so quickly. Um, uh, but here, our specific research focus for the last two years was uh, uh, basically two questions. Um, what is the relationship between illicit economies and shifting political settlements, local political settlements that we identified? And then what roles um, does brokerage and specifically coercive brokerage uh, play in the making and unmaking of um, uh, of political settlements? And and here um, the uh, the lead method I would say was basically traveling along two identified major drug trafficking routes and assessing 
from different angles of the stakeholders, people involved uh, um, at, at the different steps, basically, of those routes, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the political uh, context here uh, um, along this route. And that is something that we've been implementing only over the last couple of months. So this is why some of the results are definitely still preliminary. Rasul Khan, please, um, over to you. Next slide, fieldwork. Thank you. For strength two, uh, also we use a different uh, type of uh, research tools that uh, was uh, including the guideline interview in six uh, targeted district of two provinces with uh, uh, state officials, businessmen, traders, and uh, some uh, social actors, uh, society actors that uh, we conducted that in 2020. And the second type of the guideline tools we also use in this uh, two provinces and including eight uh, life history with the com uh, Malaysia commanders and uh, also with uh, uh, main drug uh, traffic uh, uh, along the sorry along the two main drug uh, uh, trafficking uh, routes in two provinces in uh, south and also in uh, east. And that was also focused on the Malaysia commander and the people who are involved in the drug business. And the uh, third the tools which was used, that was the district profile. And uh, we cover about uh, seven district uh, uh, and provide seven district profile. And that was also, uh, we provide the stakeholder mapping and uh, also the people who are involved in this uh, uh, business. And we have focused on that. And the last one, uh, uh, the, that was the survey. The survey was covered uh, about 50 village in four districts of Nimrose provinces. And that was the household survey and then mainly focus on the arm group, uh, economy and smuggling of the drug. Uh, we have the focus on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next slide. Yes, strand three. Um, we will skip over that right now because it has just been implemented survey and, and interviews also with uh, um, people in, uh, uh, affected by the drug economy uh, in terms of consumption um, because we have not really uh, studied that yet and analyzed that yet, but it has been done and will be part of the research outputs. Uh, the third strand, health, livelihoods and vulnerabilities. Uh, please, let's move on. So emerging findings, let's start with the historic context. Next slide. Um, as Jonathan already mentioned, we focused on two uh, of the uh, originally three uh, provinces, Nangahan uh, in the east and Nimrus in the uh, southwest. Um, the char characteristics that are relevant, I would just sum up in, in a few words here. So Nangaha, uh, while we speak about borderlands, it's a historically connected, strategically placed and economically um, and politically highly relevant borderland geographically demarcated by the Spinga mountain ranges to the east and south and the Hindu Kush to the north. Um, the city and provincial capital uh, of Jalalabad uh, used to be the winter residence of Afghan kings and throughout Afghan history as a state, it has been one of the most important political centers outside Kabul. It's a king-making borderland, home to some larger and historically influential Pashtun tribes. Uh, so it's a very connected borderland, a very connected margin here, relevant margin also in political terms. Nangaha has also been defined by its status as a strong formal and informal um, economic and social interface with neighboring Pakistan, the tribal areas there. It is the location of one of the most important official Afghan border crossing via the Khyber Pass in Torham. Um, and this border based on the Durand line, still disputed, disputed by Pakistan and Afghanistan, obviously, uh, divides historically closely linked tribes on both sides. Nimrus, on the other hand, is historically um, a per peripheral frontier region between Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iran, part of the wider and once fertile Sistan Basin, but now dominated by vast deserts and temporary flood, flooded wetlands with very limited agricultural potential. So the immediate borderlands on all three sides are inhabited uh, by the Baluch, a marginalized minority uh, in the three countries. 
Uh, Nimros, however, did experience significant economic developments in parts related to our subject here only recently with the opening of the official border crossing as an official border crossing, not an informal one for smuggling with Iran at Milak in 2005 and subsequent road construction de um, uh, 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 infrastructure development connecting the province via the Dilaram Zaranj Highway to the Afghan Ring Road as well as Iranian urban centers and ports. And the boost in official and informal trade connected to that triggered some boomtown dynamics down the line then for the provincial center uh, that was for, for formerly a forgotten outpost of Zaranj. In the Afghan context, Nangaha uh, has a long um, history of opium poppy cultivation and trade. And Nimrod, on the other hand, is, relative, is a relatively newcomer to significant cultivation. Um, but as an open frontier, Nimrod has been uh, between Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan, and also bordering Helmand, where about half of Afghanistan's uh, opium is being produced, um, has been an important transit area for smuggling, um, including uh, drugs. Next slide, please. So um, the, uh, the, the, the last two decades, of course, uh, um, it was not only the, uh, uh, the, the, the provincial context that shaped the, the drug economy, it was also the, the international intervention, uh, the state building effort there, and the way um, this intervention shaped and framed um, drugs as an illegal commodity fueling wars, causing poverty and corrupting states, and that directly fed into the counter narcotics and counter insurgency policies of the post 2001 intervention. Now, while it failed to prevent a sustained increase in drug production and trafficking, and uh, uh, encouraged the and rather encouraged the geographic shift of the drug economy or parts of the economy into um, into remoter non-state borderlands. It did affect, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the, our two uh, case studies. Uh, uh, it did affect them, but in different ways. Nangaha much more so and much more directly um, than Nimrus. And I want to highlight this dilemma um, with three quotes here. Next slide, please. So the first one is um, from an interview, or two interviews rather, I, con I conducted in 2005 with the then Minister of, uh, of uh, Rural Development, Hanif Atma, and then uh, two days later with um, a senior advisor at the US Embassy, um, where they stressed basically Afghanistan does not have the luxury of time for gradual approach, quick results are needed, otherwise the drug lords will take over and transform Afghanistan into a narco state. So it's kind of that, that uh, this, 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 this risk of uh, the state being completely taken over by uh, narco states was highlighted both by representative of the Afghan government here and the mm, very influential uh, US embassy. Um, next. However, um, uh, the former UNODC head of Afghanistan, uh, Doris Buddenberg, and, and Ruttich in a, in a joint article, um, uh, cautioned us against the simplistic view of the Afghan drug economy as something inherently violent and disruptive um, and, uh, and a threat to, uh, to state building and later on uh, part of the uh, counterinsurgency threat. Mm, and they stress, and this is coincides with, with some of the, uh, of, of the leading um, researchers here, of course, and the, and the uh, in the team of drugs and disorder, um, that it has been a relatively non-violent, non-exclusive, and in many traditionally cultivating areas, also socially embedded economy. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, over the course of, um, of the intervention, uh, Nangaha was much more affected by this kind of uh, uh, law enforcement uh, uh, paradigm, paradigm than Nimrus. Um, and uh, the next uh, quote uh, reflects this, uh, this dilemma uh, quite dramatically. Um, it's uh, from, an, from a recent interview that OSDR conducted with a, um, with a senior tribal leader from uh, Achin in Nangaha province. And I'll just summarize it here. It's basically, he, he stresses that initially um, and the Kaza area, it was not, uh, it was not, was not considered to be illegal. Um, then uh, uh, local leaders, uh, elders were uh, co-opted by the government and convinced uh, to, to help them uh, push forward the uh, like eradication measures. And they did that, they convinced the people um, uh, to eradicate, um, uh, hired, uh, hired even uh, tractors, were indebted, he claims that he's still indebted. 
and then the compensation was not forthcoming. He claims that basically it was stolen by the by the government, but the people accused him of uh, of having pocketed the money. He lost his um, his face. He's still ashamed to this day. Lost the trust with his people. Lost his uh, social prestige. And basically, the people started growing drugs in remote areas and moved uh, to the, where the Taliban were ruling um, uh, as a result of this frustration. Next slide, please. Another um, very important, more recent uh, uh, development over the last uh, uh, 20 years, last uh, two decades, basically, was changing of the control regimes along the border. And this has had less to do with the Afghan state or the emerging Afghan state, but more with the neighboring states and the decisions how they um, uh, how they decided to uh, shape their um, uh, their borderlands. So since 2015. Um, Rasul Khan, can you mute yourself? It's a little bit noisy in the background. Um, since 2015 in Nangarhar, uh, uh, Pakistan has been fencing off most parts of the border, effectively redu um, reducing established informal border crossings, specialized in specific smuggling activities like drugs and various transit goods, and took control over the remaining ones, mostly two of them uh, of late, and the late, uh, it, it was only one uh, at, at uh, Tabai. Um, uh, still open um, and uh, very much uh, re reduced um, uh, open access. And this had an immediate impact on the social and economic and everyday life of the border communities who used to have open access uh, to, uh, to the tribal areas of Pakistan, leading to protest, mobilization and resistance. Um, some forms of resistance that resulted from that. Um, you can see that on this map, basically, the number of, uh, of, uh, of, of border crossings assessed in the first part of the project it was uh, mostly still open and then gradually closing down since 2016, reduced to just basically one in the south remaining. I will talk about that in a second. In Imbros, Iran has been um, enforcing its border infrastructure, walls and watchtowers drastically since 2009, reducing the ones widely uh, open access and changing informal cross-border flows. Adaptation has been more quiet, less political protest, um, with large exit uh, migration uh, from the immediate borderlands because of reduced access and, and uh, economic uh, possibilities. And the remaining population very often turn to a kind of smuggling, often survival smuggling of drugs, um, taking large detours uh, and higher risks in smuggling across this fortified border. Next slide, please. So we, um, for the um, remaining uh, rem remaining uh, slides, we'll mostly focus on the drug routes here. First of all, just introducing them, starting with Nangaha, because that has been mostly already uh, further analyzed. And in the end, I will also turn to a very sh brief um, one slide showing what we have so far on Nimros. Um, next slide, please. And we start basically by uh, by explaining shifts in the market. Rasul Khan, you need to unmute yourself and then please um, explain how and why the main drug markets in Nangaha shifted over the, over the past 20 years. Yes, uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, uh, based on the long history of the drug production in the uh, East uh, region, the market uh, the markets were shifted because of uh, several factors in reason. Please click on the map. Uh, to show the location. Yes, uh, up to 2005, the market was in Ghani Hill district and uh, uh, there was open market for drug, uh, uh, but uh, and because of uh, some government in the US and UK uh, pressure, the market was uh, shifted to upper area. Please click on the map again, sorry. To the Shadal Bazaar. Shadal is in upper Achin and that uh, shifted there and that was continued there uh, up to 2014. And uh, because of the new insurgency group uh, created there in Achin district and uh, with the name of IS and there were uh, opposite with Taliban and their policy is also very strict against the drug production and drug trading. And also because of them, uh, the presence of them in uh, upper Achin the market again shifted to the uh, other location to Hugani district. Uh, there was there uh, that continued there. The market was for several years. 
in uh, 2017. Uh, again, uh, there was uh, some operation from government uh, side in uh, National Army there instead of uh, Daesh because Daesh was start their activity there in the Hugan district and because and before that uh, the area was controlled by Taliban because uh, the market shifted there. But when the Daesh arrived there and then uh, the government start operation and the market escaped from that area to the permanent uh, base of the Taliban to Shirzad district in 2017. And there, there was an open market there because the area was controlled by Taliban and no any problem for trader there. Thank you. Thank you. In a way, the markets were shifting not towards violence and disorder, but seeking out places um, in which they could operate uh, more orderly and quietly. Um, now, uh, I just briefly explain to you the uh, the route that was covered in 2021 by OSDR. We start in this Taliban control for 11 years, main base of the Taliban in Nangahan and Shirzad district, please click. Um, the purple areas here, basically, you can see high pro uh, po uh, poppy uh, cultivation probability, uh, and the green areas, low probability, but also agricultural lands, just as a backdrop here. So um, the markets basically used into, into Taliban-controlled uh, uh, areas. These were mobile markets, but also permanent markets set themselves up there, both for opium poppy, um, uh, some heroin, and also hashish. Uh, both produced locally, hashish mostly then produced from the outside and being brought into Shirzad and, tra and, and traded there. Um, now from, uh, from, from there, the transporters, please click, um, the transporters en route to the, until the Taliban, recent Taliban takeover, hidden second level marketplace around Marko Bazar and Shinwar, uh, specialize in state avoidance rather than striking deals um, uh, with uh, 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 with state agents and associated militias along the way. It came to some uh, surprise to me because the, the, these arrangements have been over time and in different parts of Afghanistan different. But here it seemed to be difficult for them to have long-term stable arrangements, hence they practiced, I mean, they used the main roads, but uh, used uh, uh, de uh, small detours and trying to avoid and hide the, the uh, 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 drug trafficking because they felt that the deals that could, can be made were not permanent and not reliable and selective law enforcement was a real uh, high risk to lose uh, the produce. Now, um, depending on wholesale traders' arrangements and preferences at this second level uh, clandestine market, um, the drugs may be stored, pooled or directly uh, uh, or sent directly for further processing and sale to Pakistan. Uh, since the Daesh Islamic State shocked, there are few, uh, there have been few remaining major processing capacities in Nangarhar. This is why they are sent to Pakistan process there. Um, next click. Um, since the consolidation of, uh, uh, of the border that we talked about from the Pakistani side in this case, only two main uh, cross-border routes for drugs from Marco into Pakistan remained. One was the uh, uh, the major one through the official border crossing at Torham, difficult to research, and the information we have here is more sketchy and we are taken with a grain of, um, of doubt, of course, uh, uh, of care. And the other one that we researched in greater detail, very significant, so is going through one district of choice, uh, the southern route Durbaba, um, to the informal crossing of Tabai, controlled by uh, a local alliance around a long standing power broker and former governor who set up a very, um, yeah, a rather, uh, for the trade, from the trader's point of view, reliable, um, uh, reliable uh, local governance structure, distributive structure, facilitating both drug trade and also, um, until it, uh, it was closed off from the Pakistani side, uh, the re-import or the re-export into Pakistan of transit good, goods uh, via Sasobai. So um, these two routes re basically remained open. Uh, so. We ask ourselves basically why this route, why these choices, what informed them. There are a number of them, but we want to focus basically on the um, on the governance arrangements along the route and what they tell us about choices and preferences here. Click. So we mentioned that already. In, uh, the Taliban in the interviews also, and we come up, I'll show, I will show a couple of, uh, of quotes here uh, that support that. 
um, the predictability of the arrangements in the Taliban controlled area from the perspective of different uh, stakeholders involved in the drug economy was always highlighted. Click. Um, and this quote basically underlines what are the benefits of the Taliban, 100% reliable, uh, the taxes are clear, uh, the calculations are clear, uh, and it's sort of, you know, they, they provide for rudimentary um, uh, security uh, in the areas that they govern. That was from their point of view. Uh, however, uh, they preferred the transportation by a specialized transporters who could make either arrangements or avoid state presence because the routes were much better along um, uh, 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 government controlled uh, ways, but it was much more unreliable in terms of the governance of the, those routes along the way. Uh, but otherwise, um, uh, the alternatives would have damaged the cars. Click. And another click. So along these uh, yeah, the governance controlled roads, the, the, the subject was really this kind of unpredictability and especially uh, not even the bribes, but more the, uh, the selective enforcement uh, account and narcotics measures, losing, lose, losing the whole uh, uh, drugs and then knock out on problems, uh, conflicts that emerged from that, being imprisoned, having to buy yourself out. So this, uh, this kind of a more chaotic way um, un unable to, uh, to strike deals, and we have a quotation here of a smaller militia commander who was then who had a, had a lucrative uh, um, uh, uh, roadblock here, and he was replaced basically when it became uh, more attractive by a higher level um, NDS, that is uh, Secret Service related uh, commander. Um, uh, once they got uh, the, the wind that this is a, 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 an interesting checkpoint, but it's any it's it's a, it's a quite unpredictable situation. Next. Another click. Mm -hmm. Predictable law. Yeah. And then I already explained the situation um, a very, in a very sketchy way. In Durbaba, we have a, uh, that's a case study that we studied and published also in detail because that's quite interesting. I can't go into details right now, but basically it's a, um, it's a local political settlement over more than 15 years. They tried to copy that in which the resources from the drug economy, I cut it really very short right now, are invested into this uh, political settlement, keeping the most important representatives of the five local dominant tribes happy um, uh, and also organize, uh, arranging for um, for vetted, uh, tribally vetted uh, local militias that kept the Taliban and Daesh out and also the official state uh, agencies at bay, keeping a local peace, very well connected to the other side, Pakistani side since jihadi times, to the Afridi Peace Committee there, um, and basically just having a distributional arrangement that worked until it broke down um, uh, uh, in, the, in the last year of the Ghani government. Next. And that is related uh, to um, the attempt of, uh, on the one hand, formalizing central state rule, exchanging the local governors with more uh, technocratic people, um, uh, uh, the, the, the police commanders, but also with the environment in which basically uh, militias, uh, state associated militias, uh, there was an attempt to bring them under um, NDS control. Um, pushing some of the more locally embedded out and that caused, in the north it caused much more upheaval, but we can also see this kind of push in the last year of the Ghani government, uh, particularly um, unsettling local settlements uh, to the detriment of basically um, uh, those arrangements in which it worked. It didn't work everywhere, but in Dorbaba it worked for, as I said, 15 years. Okay, next. And that is a quotation basically highlighting uh, during this fieldwork over the last year, uh, these, uh, the, 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 the upheaval, uh, the shakeup that took place when uh, militias fr uh, from other neighboring districts tried to get a share in the, in the, in the drug business from Durbaba and this whole, um, this, this whole stable arrangement broke down. Next. Now, very briefly, we are already approaching and have to approach the, the, uh, towards the end here, at least of Nangaha, and then we have one slide for Nimros. Um, so on brokerage functions that are key uh, in order to provide for, at least from the perspective of, um, of traders and, and transporters in the drug economy um, that were highlighted on the case of Durbaba uh, are the following. So basically we have balancing the interests of um, 
uh, organization and uh, 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 of local elites with organizational and potentially violent uh, um, uh, spoiling uh, capacity um, and for that basically you need resources in this case case rents from the smuggling including the drug smuggling in order to um, uh, to uh, uh, to, to balance the interests here. Apex brokers like the one we have identified here and interviewed uh, are not only in, involved in sort of uh, surfing along uh, those lines, but also involved in, in actively setting the distributive table, um, figuratively speaking, um, and defining the rules of negotiation, how to distribute those rents uh, in a fair manner. And they need a lot of social prestige um, uh, so that people trust them that this is done in a fair way. They also need coercive potential of their own um, to keep those who cannot be part of that at bay. In this case, it was uh, a sixth tribal group that was not part of this arrangement um, and uh, setting up these kind of uh, local militias with, a, uh, with some social standing and vetting uh, was operational for that. And finally, all of those brokers that we encountered, um, uh, they, they make their name and their social prestige by uh, being regarded as problem solvers, especially in, in, in mediating um, uh, uh, conflicts between uh, different um, uh, different local groups um, and doing that in a fair way. That is a key source of, uh, of prestige, especially uh, when the state is perceived as not being very uh, efficient in that. Next. That is just a quotation, basically, that sums up what I just said in, 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 uh, in a local interview on what, what are the more, most important um, uh, functions that a successful broker here has to provide. Next. Oh, we skipped this one here. I covered that already. And finally, um, unless Jonathan jumps in and, and cuts me short already now, uh, just uh, three minutes here on Nimros uh, that has just been assessed. Uh, the main, and I'll just focus here on similarities and differences. Um, the trading route that was identified here. So again, the purple areas are high poppy probability, uh, green areas, agricultural areas um, uh, with lower probability. Uh, let's start with, uh, with uh, cultivation. Click, please. Similar to Nangaha, uh, cultivation moved into Taliban, uh, more, more um, sustainably long-term Taliban controlled areas. Um, uh, in uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, along those those fertile regions, like it's, it's basically Bakwa and Khashrot here, not the immediate border areas, but uh, areas um, uh, with the Pashto major, majority population here, and long-term Taliban control, if you will, governance structures already set up there, um, and the Rotba in the south. Uh, there, click, please. There was an influx also of cultivators driven by ex uh, the expansion of agricultural lands and um, uh, in those areas, uh, technological in innovations like uh, um, uh, deep uh, wells, uh, diesel run later also, um, um, solar panel run, <clears throat> uh, and but also by, because of er eradication pressure, which, which was not as strong as in Nimrod as in Nangaha, but still it was there and increasing towards last years. Um, uh, from government controlled areas into those areas and basically uh, setting themselves up there. Um, cultivation um, was drought affected in general and that pushed since 2018 farmers pri uh, into prioritizing on the remaining field that they could still irrigate uh, uh, poppy cultivation over, uh, over other crops. Um, next, on markets and processing, <clears throat> Well, basically, we have uh, uh, those uh, markets also in, in those areas uh, which, uh, uh, with uh, uh, poppy, uh, poppy cultivation. That's Bakwa and Khashrot. Uh, since 2007, tali fully Taliban controlled. Um, and then also a very important market since 2002, Taliban controlled, Baramcha, um, which uh, is in, 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 in Helmand at a major crossing, but also market and processing side. Uh, next. Once again, oh yeah. So these are then uh, the the, the th uh, um, and once more, let's have all three trafficking routes here up on the screen. Um, so uh, the top one here is basically uh, a traffic uh, route for small time, uh, small small scale smugglers, but in large numbers, um, trafficking through Kang district and uh, via uh, yeah high risk uh, 
catapults, ladders, um, uh, negotiated openings in the in, in the border fencing, uh, small parties, uh, small uh, small scale uh, and and uh, and survival, but in in some of course uh, significant uh, numbers. Then we have the below that uh, similar to uh, to Nangarha, the the main trafficking. Uh, via the official border gate, but you need to be very well connected uh, with strong uh, brokerage uh, access uh, to use that for large quantities, high level smuggling. And the, um, the third one, uh, this detour here to, uh, towards the south, that's different from Nangaha. You have the option here in Nimbus, basically, where you have vast stretches of land which are not have been for a long time not under government control and also all the sporadic Taliban control, actually. Um, and these are large scale quantities that are being transported and uh, shipped through Baram Shah and Dak, um, uh, then the Mashkel route uh, in, in Pakistan, Baluchistan, and into Iran. And uh, here, the, these uh, traders usually go on convoy, have their own security detail, and uh, are basically yeah, uh, avoiding any um, interdiction from, from, from the state and even uh, you know, have limited contact with the Taliban, but have to provide for security themselves. Um, in terms of quantities, um, the uh, the southern route, even though it's much longer, uh, uh, OSDR estimates that it's about one to one to ten, uh, so ten times more than the uh, than the direct access uh, via the uh, st state-controlled uh, border in Kang, um, and also in terms of a profit that can be made these are preliminary estimates uh this route is more profitable especially for heroin it's about twice as profitable per kg okay so now last slide uh three points three take takeaways here um first uh, state expansion and tightening of the border regime led uh, to different forms of adaptation. Um, uh, border communities reacted via survival strategies. That would be more the Kang way, or also the and, and then the, 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 the protest in Nangaha, which was unsuccessful. Obviously, state avoidance or migration. Uh, Kang, uh, uh, the border the border uh, lands of, of Nimrus, they lost uh, 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 nearly half of the population. One reason was the, the, the border fencing uh, or the border walling in that case. Those with financial and political capital, on the other hand, they maneuver into a more vertically integrated, professionalized and high profit trading economy. Um, state expansion has unsettled some local political settlements and some borderland regions. Um, the technocratic approach to state building uh, uh, was unable to build or sustain such local settlements. However, we shouldn't overinterpret that because uh, it was these kind of settlements that were sustainable over such a long time seem to be the exception rather than the rule in those borderlands that we covered. And finally, predictability for people involved in the illicit and illicit economy um, is clearly a priority. Uh, um, and the Afghan state has been unable to provide this kind of security predictability regulation necessary to stabilize political settlements and to, um, uh, and to be able to, uh, 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 for communities to basically survive and flourish uh, in those remoter borderlands. Um, it has rather been associated with unpredictability and selective enforcement. So as a last, as a last observation here, I feel that at least in these cases that we cover, the drug economy is not really trying to retreat into anarchic hills, as Scott would have put it, to avoid being governed, but are rather selecting governance services and social order that works for them and that can be provided by the Taliban or by these kind of hybrid government ar arrangement as in Durbaba, but they very much seek, seek out predictability over unpredictability and that is driving their decisions. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm just going to start the clock. I've got one of these. Oh. Um, good okay. afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karen Brock, um, and I'm delighted to introduce this afternoon Adam Payne um, and his presentation on what are the impacts of counter narcotics and development efforts on political disorder and livelihoods, one of the four strands of the research in Afghanistan. Over to you, Adam. Many thanks, Karen. Um, so I'll pick up from where Jan stopped, but also first to acknowledge that I speak on behalf of the AREU team, um, people who can't be here, Mujib, Gulsum, Khalid and Nawafe, who've been an essential part of the research. 
Next slide, please. There are four sub-questions that sort of underlay our interest in investigation on the impact of counter-narcotics and development efforts. Firstly, questions about who's been involved, what actors, organisations and policy documents have actually been central to the drugs narrative. What have been the key programmes that have arisen out of this relevant to drugs? And how have these policies and programmes interacted with the drug economy and process of political and economic change, particularly in the borderlands? And what have been the effects and impacts of these policies and programmes, both intended and unintended, on these activities? Our answers to these questions draw from a range of data sources, ranging from interviews, policy text analyses, mapping of what donors have done, and an in-depth case study which of a programme that ran over 10 years that speaks to many elements of these questions. Thank you. Next slide, please. Just to point to our key research sites and Cardiff, where we investigated this Cardiff programme, um, the C Comprehensive Agricultural Research Development Programme, which I'll come back to in a minute. We worked in, essentially in two provinces, Badakhshan in the north, and in the first, the top row, German Khosh districts were where we were focused on our interests. And I just want to present these maps to show, in a sense, the indication of the nature of the mountain economy, the concentration in mountain economies into narrow valleys um, of cultivation, limited areas of opportunity. And then the sites in Nangahar, in Bersud and Karma, which you can see from the broad agricultural areas, are areas of relatively high potential, um, double crop irrigation, well irrigated, highly fertile land. So two agriculturally very different contexts. But the third column on the right hand side shows that not far from Karma and Bersud in Nangahar are two districts that are very like Kosh and Germ, Achin and Kohiani, who are two marginal um, districts, mountainous districts, where opium has also been concentrated. Next slide, please. So which actors have been important in framing the, um, policy documents and the trajectory of drug policy? And I want to make the general point that policy making in general in Afghanistan has been contentious. And in that sense, different actors different donors have had different policy models. And in some respects, drug making policy has been no different from that in agriculture or in health or in education or in policing. But it's also clear there's been a very uneven trajectory and people have got their fingers burnt over their involvement in the counter narcotics agenda. It started off in the early days with the World Bank, UNODC, ARU and the British government really taking more of a developmental approach towards drugs. The World Bank with DFID tried to mainstream counter narcotics as a development challenge and not in a sense position it as a sort of a drug problem. And they also provided, as the US came more onto the scene, a strong opposition to the US push for eradication and interdiction as core elements of counter narcotic policy from 2005 onwards. But it's also true to say that from that time, 2005 and six onwards, the US became increasingly central to the stage of drug policy. And even more so from 2009-10 onwards, when in a sense the link between drugs and counterinsurgency was emphasized. The consequence of these diverse interests, of these diverse policies have been diverse, contradictory and really conflictual approaches towards counter narcotics reflected in competitive organizational structures. The US on the one hand supporting the Ministry of Interior, the DFID on the other hand supporting and responsible for the establishment of the Ministry of Counter Narcotics. But the Afghan government has also been engaged. It's not simply been a, a silent or sleeping partner. It might, you might think it's been a client, but in fact the project has also served diverse interests within the Afghan government. And if we turn to the next slide, I illustrate this with reference to the Cardiff program. I mean, there were certainly budget battles between the donor and government. The donor wanted off-budget projects, i.e. projects over which they had direct control and they established technical enclaves in ministries to implement them. 
But the government didn't want this for all sorts of reasons about salary levels, about competition, and about actually being able to present for the government itself to be active in the field. So there was what, that was one set of dynamics between donor and government. Next slide, please. But there were also battles within and between ministries over the programme. As the first quote says, there was a battle over Cardiff. A minister came to the ministry. He could not accept that the Cardiff director actually was better paid than him. And he asked the director to hire this friend or that relative, and he wanted to interview on how, intervene on how recruitment was done, grants were allocated. But the, the technical enclave resisted this, which caused all sorts of problems and a fight between the minister and the project. But there were also fights between ministries, as the second quote illustrates. Some of the ministers didn't have good relationships with each other, and the, there were battles between ministers from the Abdullah part of the unity government and those from the Ashraf Ghani. And they struggled to, in a sense, get resources out of the project and competed, which ultimately undermined the project. Next slide, please. So what have been the key national programmes that have had an impact on drug issues? If you read the policy documents, they're all about balanced, sequenced, appropriately focused um, in relation to um, how drug policy should be actually be implemented, divided between security, criminality, peace building, health and alternative livelihoods. But in practice, it's actually been security and criminality that has attracted the greater level of funding and intervention. And the battles between these different areas have caused incoherence between interventions resulting from different policy intentions. So on the one hand, you've had even within the sort of more security side with the US pursuing manual eradication, but influenced of course by local politics as how it landed on the ground. While at the same time, you've had US forces who are more interested in the security agenda, actively working with key players in the opium economy um, at the same time. So incoherent. On paper, as I said, balanced, sequenced and integrated. Firstly, we should identify alternative livelihoods and only later should, in a sense, we begin to introduce a more punitive development. In practice, eradication was prioritised over alternative livelihoods, which were really very short term. The US did not achieve, by its own admission, balance and symbiosis between its different intervention efforts. Also true that insecure provinces generally have attracted more funding, and particularly more level of CN funding, of course leading to a concentration of counter-narcotic activities in borderline growing provinces. And it's also true that the alternative livelihood projects have basically been focused in the ones that have been easy to operate in, in areas with good security, or where transitions had already taken place, and therefore marginalising opium poppy production to remoter areas. Next slide, please. So how have policies and programmes interacted with key drug economy and processes of political and economic change? There have been direct and indirect impacts of such policies, and it's been dynamic, spatially and temporally specific, differentiated according to actors and place. And as one can see from the opium poppy data, Open poppy areas ebbed and flowed across the borderlands according to price, policies, insecurity and so forth. And the effects have again varied according to individuals' position, whether you're a labourer, growing income from the harvest, whether you're a grower, trader or processor. And when he has to look at the history of the nature of trade systems in Badakhshan, for example, as to how it became concentrated, and then became make more fractioned over time to recognize that it's been highly dynamic. And the consequences that opium poppy has contributed in both positive and negative ways to the lives of all these people. Much of the assessment of programs is focused on outcomes and claims for increased in rural income and jobs. It's been a very income focused approach towards opium, but it's ignored the multi-dimensional role of opium poppy to growers that they use it to handle radical uncertainty and they have poorly understood the ways in which actual commodity markets of which opium is no, not exceptional actually work in Afghanistan. Next slide please. 
So if you actually look at commodity markets, opium is no different from whether you're talking about trading vegetables, poultry or onions. Major traders use cross-border trade control to regulate and control the market. As this quote from here points out, the reason is these customs offices. This big trader had a good connection. He, he negotiated so he paid no tax. And as the comment, commentator says, if the government is playing differently with each investor, then competition in the market will be complicated. In other words, it's not competition on price, but competition according to power. Yet growing agricultural markets has remained central to the aim of encouraging a shift out of open poppy production and central to the alternative development model, but it's ignored how prices actually get formed in commodity markets in Afghanistan. It also speaks to past experiences of agrarian transitions in the global north and south, and it's not clear that it speaks to where Afghanistan is now agriculturally and what its agricultural future is. Next slide, please. So if you look at many of the assumptions behind the Cardiff programme, they made all sorts of assumptions about how it would work, that the selection of people who would be involved in it would be based on discipline, rational um, criteria, not influenced by personal relationships and so forth. But it's absolutely clear that's not how it worked in practice. Those who were well connected, those who had influence, benefited from the programme. It also assumed that growers would have access to inputs and this would um, allow them to therefore compete. But if you actually look at credit relations in all commodity markets, opium included, people are basically tied into what we call interlocking contracts. The only credit they got was from the trader and they were compelled to sell their produce back to the trader. And the trader benefits twice as it were um, doubly on that benefit and therefore prices and price formation was heavily regulated by the role of traders. And so the markets are not driven by price and open competition and key traders actually are in enormous positions of power to buy cheap and sell dear. They were practicing market arbitrage, they were not competing on the basis of price. Next slide please. The opium economy was something that ended up being a counter-narcotics issue and because of the push to eradication and so forth and security issues that came with it, it disappeared off the development agenda. Many drug-focused, non-drug-focused agencies wanted nothing to do with it and indeed Cardiff shifted away from its initial focus as a counter-narcotics programme. There were also key actors in government and outside that had a strong vested interest in the continuation of the drug program. And with the regime change that has now taken place, it remains to be seen what is actually going to happen, although the conditions of economic insecurity are very likely to push growers back into, back into opium poppy cultivation again. Next slide, please. So what, and this comes to the final question, what are have effects and impacts been intended and unintended? Of course, the intention of counter narcotics policy was to reduce opium poppy area and trafficking and grow illicit agricultural economy. In neither case has that happened. Um, and as we will see in the slide, we'll come to in a minute, that if you look at the opium poppy probability in Khosh now, one of our study districts in Badakhshan, it's expanded dramatically in 2019 in comparison with 2010. Areas have moved back into open poppy. Area, open poppy area has not decreased and the agricultural economy has not grown either. There have been important unintended consequences. There's been a reconcentration of open production in marginal non-state spaces, which are insecure and in themselves make it difficult for development problems projects to actually operate. So it's reinforced inequality. It's reinforced market power by key cross-border traders. And the programs have been a resource for fueling rivalries. Rivalries within ministries <coughs> and rivalries, of course, on the ground level. And with counter-narcotics, of course, has been that element of violence and various forms of violences, par paramilitaries, the violence of eradication and the structural and overt threats 
associated with loss of income and so forth. So there have been multiple unintended consequences of the programme. Next slide, please. This just shows the contrast between Hosh in 2010-2019 and the dramatic spread of the purple spots showing the rise in opium poppy probability. Next slide, please. <coughs> My final slide concerns conclusions. You could, if you were being charitable, say that in a sense Cardiff was the example of the programme that moved beyond alternative development, making alternative development normal development. But normal development, in the words of Cardiff, was about actually just market development. It focused on areas of high potential. It therefore marginalised open economies. And Cardiff, even in its own lights, did not achieve its goal. This begs the question as whether, in the sense, the development model for alternative development has had its time. It no longer works if it ever indeed works or only would work under specific contextual and historical circumstances. One has to recognize, I think, that for Afghanistan, opium is the last crop option remaining in the borderlands for many people. It's the only thing that offers them any means to live and survive. Beyond opium, there are no agricultural or even urban futures. These do not people do not find work, reliable work, good work in urban settings. <coughs> People are tied, caught, between the inevitability of having to leave where they are, but the impossibility of staying away. Life in the rural is precarious, life in the urban is precarious. Opium poppy gives them their only option. Which means we need to start thinking differently about development models. And one possibility there might be a much more a social welfare approach um, in these more marginal areas where opium becomes concentrated. Thank you. My presentation. Um, was supposed to come after it and uh, mainly focusing, keep on the first slide please, mainly focusing on um, linking uh, the, the research as a whole um, um, with some aspects of um, how uh, this is connected with, for example, sustainable development goals and just look it through that lens as well um, as also looking, having some broader reflections. So um, please go to the next slide. Uh, so one broader uh, connection we make um, is about uh, uh, the fact that building peaceful and inclusive societies, which is the SDG 14 purpose, um, um, is particularly challenging in the borderlands where opium poppy economy is a big part of the picture uh, and where drugs also conflict as well as development are pre-meeting uh, in everyday lives. Our research demonstrates how counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism and securitization of the drugs and narcotics issue became entangled, uh, resulting in policy failures. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we, what we highlighted here um, in terms of, you know, our, our studies in general is uh, the point that drugs in the borderland economies are uh, a development challenge and not alone a law and order issue on its own. Peace, justice and strong institutions can only be achieved by politically informed development uh, approaches to these challenges. Uh, the examples that uh, hopefully you will hear more from Adam is, is clearly highlighting that, par uh, that part. Uh, developing a more analytical understanding of different borderlands and drivers of their political economies, such as in, in such understanding, basically can become uh, the basis for setting realistic goals uh, for change and for identifying appropriate process-based measurable indicators for progress on development outcomes, including the ones of um, SDGs. What we did in one of our publications, which is available also online, is to go in details in terms of, you know, what the SDG 16 indicators are. And we notice it's mostly security oriented uh, and less on, on other aspects of this. And that's why uh, we emphasize on, on, on focusing on realistic and measurable indicators. Progress should also be focused on um, incremental improvements in poverty and food security outcomes for borderland uh, rural population and not only on opium uh, poppy metrics. 
this is again going back to sort of our uh, reviews and reflections on how every year we have reports being published that is talking about the size of poppy cultivation in the country and not much about the depth of the poverty and how uh, this uh, particular drugs is part of the people's um, you know economic sources or food security and so forth as also was mentioned in the beginning by uh, by Jonathan and others uh, next slide please um, so, in conclusion, uh, what we sort of concluded in terms of the policy implications, we realized that there are basically two parallel and widely disconnected worlds. The world of the people for whom uh, opium cultivation, processing and trading was central to their livelihoods. And the world of the people who formulated policies, designed projects, wrote reports and project goals and success stories. Unfortunately, in our observation, these two worlds did not really connect with each other much. Um, as the country is descending into deep humanitarian crisis, we are all discussing about it um, uh, after the shifts, a major political shifts in the country. There are currently no signs of ban on opium production in the borderlands, nor is there a clear uh, strategy uh, for different from different actors, including those of donors in terms of the future of counter narcotic efforts are these programs that are completely suspended going to become part of the humanitarian response are they going to be completely dismantled as they are at the moment as we speak so these are questions to be sort of uh, raised um, at this point we also have to reiterate the point that peace is not simple absence of active armed conflict uh, this is more referring about you know, an incredible decrease in violence at the moment post August 15, uh, uh, 2021 last year. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the problems are solved, particularly when it comes to drugs issues. Next slide, please. So finally, some uh, particular recommendations uh, to be highlighted here. We believe there is need for more engagement uh, with those who are directly affected by drug production when designing humanitarian as well as development policies and programs. We know this is a priority at the current situation, but we have to really address the drugs and illicit economy issues, even when we think about humanitarian aid and assistance. Ensure and provide evidence that bans or alternative livelihoods programs offer a viable and sustainable solution to the livelihoods of opium growers and opium labor. Avoid criminal Criminal, criminalizing farmers and forced eradication of illicit uh, crops. Evidence from Afghanistan is clearly showing that it, this is an effective approach that does not have really tangible results. And finally, approach drug policy with reduction of violence in mind. This requires tools for actively monitoring the effects of different policies, their consequences in terms of violence reduction, and an assessment of which groups are mostly affected by these policies. So, because this study in Afghanistan particularly focused in the borderland areas, we've basically connected the situation and livelihoods of people in those borderland areas and how they will be affected. Um, I just end here and with the hope that we will hear from um, Adam about the uh, specific case study that we have. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ozala. Um, before moving on to Adam, uh, just uh, this is a question that I'd like um, Jan and Gulen Razul to think about, and we'll, when from Stella, who's interested in the processing of the crops and uh, how basic are the processing centres? Is there expertise there that could be used for manufacturing other products and so on? So, could you think about that? Sadra Dean has asked a couple of questions here, which I think are very relevant to what you've been saying. Um, and uh, about um, the impact of alternative development. So maybe you can come back to that and ask you that question. Particularly in light of that, your concluding points about you know, people who have got, they've got no option, they cannot stay and they can't go in a way. And, 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 and Opium is the, the kind of the, the last resort for those kinds of marginal communities. But I wonder, um, to start off the Q&A, Jan or Hunan Rasul, whether you would be able to just say something about uh, processing. 
um, and the question there that uh, has been asked. Yeah, I responded already in the chat, what, the little that I know, because that is, of course, something for the field team and especially Azizullah, who is, I think, with uh, Rasul Khan, maybe he discussed it already. Uh, there are very famous cooks uh, that are even being hired out and they have a value in themselves um, uh, in, 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 uh, in the process of, um, of producing um, uh, the different stages of uh, herring production. Um, but whether they really have a chemical education that could be transferred and, 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 and uh, knowledge that could be used beyond the specific field, that is a question to um, uh, OSDR in case you have been that close. I know that the cooks and the processing and the, uh, is always the most sensitive uh, part of the field work. Uh, but maybe you can briefly, Rasul Khan, come in here and give some feedback on the knowledge and the transferability of knowledge that uh, those chemists, cooks, basically have. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both uh, for the question. Yes. Uh, um, Regarding the process, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, um, sensitivity, but uh, mainly we have a different uh, product uh, after the process in the in different uh, categories. That uh, the first is uh, that is the um, epidra, and uh, they produce in the first uh, step uh, the product with the name of the F, but yet uh, we not found. Uh, any exact uh, uh, information about that to what is the F, but this is the one uh, step further, uh, um, uh, the, the production of the shisha crystal. But this is, uh, the process is easy in, uh, in the first uh, history. Uh, some people, uh, they got knowledge outside, but uh, they arrive to the south and they train some people and now uh, a number and a large number of people have the skill and very easy they able to produce this uh, from the uh, wild crop which called in the local language Oman but now this is easy but in case of the process of the shisha production of the shisha and also the heroin that is a uh, very difficult and also very few uh, very few people with the name of the kokar Ustad, and they are there in the area and also these people, they have very good uh, salary from this uh, process and they're not happy to show this uh, scale to other one. And also when he work and there is a specific stage for that and on that stage, they're not allowed any other one to work with him inside the factory because he know if I transfer this skill to other one, we will last our uh, value and no one will pay this big amount of salary to us. This is uh, our uh, brief information from the field of uh, process of the uh, crops. And that is uh, regarding the geographical area that is abroad in different parts of the country and also in outside the country, we have some information in which uh, the area have this product and there is the process. Uh, uh, but this is also like uh, we present the slight shifting of the market and that is close to that and tied to the market as well to the, the process is also parallel good with the market. If there, where is the market, there is uh, immediately the factory established and the people come there. And uh, from other side, uh, in different uh, uh, nationality from outside and from inside uh, of the country, the people are involved in this process. And but uh, according to our understanding from field, in uh, just in south, there is more than one thousand uh, laboratory for the process, and some of them that was destroyed during the um, U.S. campaign uh, from. Uh, air, uh, our plan attack on the uh, laboratory in uh, approximately about 200 that was destroyed, but still more than 1,000 are there and that is active. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. So um, I'm just uh, not to add any more detail, but I think it's important to stress that one of the themes that we're exploring in this research is the the kind of how borderlands are sites of experimentation, innovation, and technological change. And I think the processing side of things, 
is one example of that, but not the only example. Um, you know, the importing of improved seeds and um, solar panels um, and also shifts in drug markets and, and, and you know, changes to the production of methamphetamine. All these are examples of, of innovative adaptations to an environment of high risk. So this is, a, this is very different from the way that Borderlands often presented as being kind of stagnant or lagging behind. Um, there's, there's things happening um, and upgrading and adaptation uh, and very sophisticated kind of packages technologically, but also financial and labor regimes to these situations. Um, Adam, there's a number of questions around alternative developments and perceptions of it. Um, I wonder if you and also maybe Ozara had any thoughts um, around around that. So, Sarah Jadine says, um, well, there's a number of questions about one about the challenges faced during field work after the Taliban takeover, which might be for Yan and Gulen to, to to address, but also about the effectiveness and impacts of alternative developments um, and you know what perceptions people have of these programs. So. Adam, do you want to say something then, Orzala? Yeah, yourself, Adam. Sorry. Um, on the question of effectiveness and impact of alternative development, I think, I mean, in general, many of the so-called alternative development programs have been very short term. They've very much focused on the crop substitution um, and there's not been much more to them than that. And they've come and gone and have had marginal effects. The CARDEF programme was interesting. It was long term, um, over 10 years. It attempted a sort of agribusiness approach. Um, it worked in certain respects. I mean, interestingly, um, it, and something it didn't really pay much attention to, it focused particularly, one particular aspect of it was its uh, potato programme in Khosh which in a sense was much more of an, a classic alternative development, full rural development support, which worked well. But once the project ended, people basically gave up and went back to opium. I mean, there wasn't the agricultural market support. I think, you know, the belief that in a sense, there are alternative agricultural crops that will take people out of opium poppy cultivation unless you're going to provide a degree, a heavy degree of market support in multiple ways, that is not a viable, even in the relatively high potential areas. There are many, there are examples from Nangaha, for example, where support for, you know, high value agriculture, greenhouses, it lasted as long as there was support from the programme. The moment it ended, people sold up the greenhouses and moved out and they were sold off. So, I think the model, and this is really the point I came to, the model of agricultural development as and a market route as being a way out of open poppy cultivation for many of the opium growing areas in Afghanistan has had its day. There is very there is not it is not a route that is going to work. Thanks, Adam. Ozala, have you got some any thoughts on this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, Jonathan, a couple of uh, quick thoughts here. Uh, with regards to um, the impact, uh, one thing just to add uh, on what uh, Adam was saying, uh, one of our initial observation was that most, uh, so Khash is an example probably otherwise, but uh, in Nengarhar, for example, the major focus of uh, Cardiff was not necessary in the areas with highest um, 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 amount of uh, poppy cultivation. So to make that linkage is whether people decided to choose between uh, going for an alternative livelihoods versus going to the drugs is, is uh, not really working in that because uh, as Adam in his presentation explained the whole uh, trajectory of initial designing to the end result of programs like Cardiff and uh, most of you, uh, Mr. Sadabdin, also you are familiar with earlier work of ARU on the Hellman Food Zone, for example, these are all examples showing that you know, it's all very program focused, disconnected from the realities, disconnected from the political economy of the whole drugs issues. And that's why 
they are probably effective in the project cycle, but as soon as the project cycle is, open, uh, is closed, then um, there is no future for it. I wanted to also add something else, which is quite fresh in terms of, you know, continuation of what we see happening. Um, uh, Cardiff um, was mostly about creating greenhouses, which provided support. And it's arrived to the communities free of cost, basically. It didn't cost much for the people. It cost for the project. It was a five, six thousand. I'm not exactly sure, but that amount of US dollars. So the, the local farmers decided to trade that to people who brought it to, moved it to, to, to Kabul. And only last week, I heard from the Kabul municipality, Sharwale Kabul, announcing quite, you know, without probably knowing the whole consequences of what we are talking about, of creating more greenhouses in the suburbans of Kabul areas. So, I mean, maybe now it's not time to go into details, but you can see the consequence or the implications of such kind of you know, examples where beyond the project cycle, if it is commercialized and the greenhouses are even opened, it's not simple to cre create greenhouses and respond to the needs. So it does, it has nothing to do with the original farmers. It moves to another very highly dense areas. It causes issues with the groundwater. It causes issues with so many other uh, challenges that we can see. So in some, um, the impacts are very project oriented. And one thing that we realized in this course of studies is to really go beyond that really, and then find the ways of connecting all these uh, uh, dots together. And um, I just will end with just making some, some quick announcement about the day three uh, as well. We are going to have a reflection on policy engagement and more details uh, in day three of this workshop. I hope those who are participating now can also join us there to, to discuss more and especially, specifically, we are interested to hear from our Afghan participants and audience uh, to give us sort of recommendation and guidance in terms of like how to really look, become more uh, effective in policy engagement at a national level within the current context. Thank you. Thanks all that, Ozaran. Thanks for that um, reminder about day three, which where we will be really focusing on the policy implications of our work. So please come along to that. Um, Isa asked uh, this question about research in a time of the, the Taliban takeover. And I mean, Yan and, and particularly Russell Khan, um, I don't, can't think of a more difficult time to be doing research in terms of methodological, ethical and security challenges. Um, could you give us a few reflections to finish off on you know, what the issues were and, and how you managed to deal with them in, in, in three minutes at most? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will try to explain very briefly in short. Yes, uh, um, we conducted uh, uh, our research uh, after takeover of Taliban and Nimruz province and that was very broad and we conducted a, a large number of uh, different type of interviews there. But uh, the main problem uh, uh, in, uh, is that the, the coordination of the research project uh, with the government uh, that will uh, that is a little difficult compared to the past, because uh, in the past um, regularly we follow this procedure and we reach to our target. But now, from one side, uh, the new employee of the government uh, they are not much familiar with uh, research uh, such as uh, our research. And this is, this, is, this is difficult to satisfy them according to the result and benefit of this research. And from other side, and, uh, during our uh, field work time, and there was no uh, much uh, active government in the district level. And because you know that in, before the takeover of the Taliban, the country, and each uh, province and also in each district level, they have the uh, commission for NGO work. And therefore, this commission, uh, they coordinate the NGO working in the, their control area. To, yet, uh, uh, to that time, when we conduct our field work in, in the province uh, uh, capital in Nimroz, and also in district level, there was no much active uh, land ministry for that, just uh, there was uh, NGO commission working there. And also, for NGO Commission, the head of the commission is in the capital of the province, but in each district, they have uh, their own representative. <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, the problem was that uh, all of them there were there were military commanders, 
and uh, but we try and uh, we satisfy them and uh, we conducted our research but uh, compared uh, sorry uh, i will just one word uh, compared to the past now uh, in the past there was much uh, security problem and that was fighting that was bombing and there was two party and among these two party working was so difficult but now this situation is uh, completely finished there is one party and one government so please yeah okay. no just 30 seconds just basically some because i i, I come uh, all, all the time in in, in 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 contact of course some surprising dif difficulties were there um that had less to do with security the complete incompetence um, uh, of the Taliban um, in terms of uh, taking decisions uh, uh, concerning government governance issues that were not security related. Um, that was a big pain for OSDR to find somebody who they could really talk to, uh, responsible. Um, the absence then, before the Taliban were very much present in the places that they controlled in the village level, suddenly they were all um, at, at provincial level. Um, uh, and um, and uh, 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 and very surprisingly, um, the demand of the population who got, especially when they when OSDR did the survey, broader survey visible, right? That suddenly uh, uh, villages felt left out, and they uh, were panicking that now all the uh, development work would stop, and um, they would be left out if they are not part of the survey. And they really put a lot of pressure. They they contacted the Taliban then. Uh, the Taliban uh, um, uh, military leader uh, uh, who was in Kabul and his deputy uh, and tried to force OSDR basically to talk to them, the Maliks, uh, the village headmen, uh, because they were so afraid that basically something was happening in terms of, you know, humanitarian aid, food distribution, uh, and they might be left out because they were not sampled. They, they were not part of the sample. And then explaining basically the logic now of uh, research is extremely difficult. It was always difficult, of course, but now for the new government, uh, they are extremely limited in the way they understand NGO work. And so that is, uh, th these are like fine lines that OSDR is maneuvering. Um, uh, but uh, very importantly, what they said in terms of physical insecurity, collateral damage, bombs going off and so forth, being shot, criminal, armed criminal groups, um, actually research got a little bit easier even. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Um, we need to finish. Um, so thank you very much for everyone who came to this session. I mean, it should stress really what we've shown today is the, the tip of the iceberg and I, I'm apologies for the, um, the technical problems we had as well, which, which cut into our time. Um, but if you want to kind of see more about what we've written, look um, at the International Journal of Drug Policy Special Issue and also a series of articles in Third World Quarterly, plus voices from the borderlands. And if you go to the expo, you can also see more details there. So we've got a break now until 3.30. I think we leave this session and then you go back to sessions and click on the next, um, the next session. So thank you very much and hopefully see many of you again soon. Goodbye.